It is Tuesday, December 5th, and this is The National. Breaking tonight, the White House confirms it will recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and the volatile region is on edge. Russia banned from the Winter Olympics. What it means for their athletes, the games, and Team Canada. But we begin with an apology from a federal cabinet minister. As someone with a disability myself, it was certainly not my intention to offend anyone. That's Kent Hare, Disabilities Minister. He's apologizing to a group of thalidomide survivors who accuse him of insulting them and humiliating them right to their faces. They'd been at a meeting demanding more compensation. Thalidomide was a government-approved drug that caused birth defects. But they say Minister Hare told them, unsympathetically, everyone in Canada has a sob story. And it didn't stop there. David Cochran explains exactly what happened, and he asked the minister to explain what he said. A tough day for Kent Hare taking public heat over something he allegedly said in private. Within a period of 30 minutes in that meeting, Minister Hare managed to insult and degrade us repeatedly. A group of thalidomide survivors saying the minister belittled them. Then he went on to say, well, you don't have it so bad. Everyone in Canada has a sob story. Lots of people have it bad in Canada. Disabled people, poor people, not just you. And he said to us, so, you probably have about 10 years left then now. That's good news for the Canadian government. Fuel for the opposition. Can the mi Minister for Persons with Disabilities clarify what he meant by these words, which he recently used while meeting with a group of thalidomide patients? While some of my comments were misconstrued, as soon as I learned my comments were felt to be offensive, I immediately called the organization directly and apologized. Hare never dealt with the specifics of the allegations during question period or when talking to reporters. Did you really say everyone in Canada has a soft story? We, we talked for a ha half hour about the trials and tribulations of many people in this country. And in fact, about the difficult situations of, of the people with thalidomide. He stuck with his non-specific apology. But did you utter that phrase? Did you actually say to this group that everyone in Canada has a sob story? We, we talked for a half hour on a numerous issues, okay? We talked about the difficulty their lives have been, the difficulty of many people with disabilities. But he did deny saying the survivors only had 10 years left. I did, I did not say that you only have 10, 10. We, our government is working as hard as we can on behalf of people with disabilities. But this wasn't just about Hare's words in that meeting. There was also an allegation about his hands. Reached out to her and grabbed her by the arm very close to her breast in a way that was inappropriate and unwelcome. And I think uh, that, was, um, that was a shock to us all too. Any touching was completely accidental. And uh, if there was, I completely apologize for it. And David joins us now with more on this because David, how big of a problem is this for hair? Well, you know, Andrew, it's never a good day when your disabled minister for persons with disabilities is accused of mocking the disabled. So there's that. And this has been a rough stretch for Hare over the past few months because in the most recent cabinet shuffle, he was demoted from veterans affairs to this portfolio and amateur sports in large part because of his inability to make progress on some of the bigger veterans issues. And now he's having this problem today. And, you know, it reminds a lot of people in this town of former conservative cabinet minister Julian Fantino when he was veterans affairs minister and he was caught on tape yelling at a group of veterans. You don't want public spats like this with stakeholders, especially where you have to defend your private conduct. Now, the saving grace for hearing this is that the thalidomide survivors, they've accepted his apology. They want to move forward. The prime minister's office at this point seems satisfied with how Hare has handled this. So a bad day for the minister, Andrew, but probably not one that is immediately fatal to his cabinet career. Mm. David Cochran in Ottawa. Thanks. You're welcome. Now, David mentioned the thalidomide survivors wanting to move forward. They're in Ottawa demanding the compensation they feel the government owes them. There are 95 such survivors born in the early 1960s with birth defects such as malformed limbs and internal organ damage. Their mothers took thalidomide to control morning sickness. It was widely prescribed and government approved, but with terrible consequences. So in 2015, the federal government tried to make amends, regular annual payments and a lump sum to each victim of $125,000. But the group today wants double that amount, saying they're struggling to make ends meet because of their disabilities. 
So, Ian, this is one file Kent Hare is reacting to. You're following another. Yeah, as Canada's Minister of Sport, he is expressing support for the International Olympic Committee's decision to ban Russia from participating in the 2018 Winter Games. Now, in years past, there was one thing certain about those Winter Games. You were going to hear the Russian anthem many, many times as athletes climbed to the top of the podium. At the upcoming Games in Pyeongchang, you will not hear it at all. The Russian Olympic uh, Committee is suspended with immediate effect. The report uh, clearly lays out an unprecedented attack on the integrity of the Olympic Games and sports. It's a blow for one of the world's most successful Olympic countries, and it's largely because of what happened here, Sochi, 2014, where the IOC says Russian officials engaged in widespread systematic doping and then tampered with test results to hide it. The impact was significant. The IOC Disciplinary Commission report says the doping scheme caused exceptional damage to the integrity of the IOC and the Olympic Games. Of course, Russian authorities denying much of this. There are threats of a boycott and accusations of political motivations. Chris Brown has the reaction from Moscow. On Russian TV tonight, athletes were bawling their eyes out. Everyone is talking about letting clean athletes go. So what does that mean? We're the dirty ones? Wailed biathlon competitor Yana Romanova. <laughs> you're not dirty, you're not dirty, assured the presenter. He might have been trying to comfort an entire country. There will be no Russian colours, no anthem, no Team Russia at the Pyeongchang Olympics in February. I think it's a political decision by the world, said this man in Moscow. This decision has nothing to do with sport. Up Russia! Still, the IOC said it wanted to give Russia a path forward. So, clean Russian athletes who haven't already been banned may be allowed to compete under an Olympic flag. The head of Russia's Olympic Committee said if there aren't any more doping offences involving Russians, Russia can earn its way back into future competitions. Still, the big question now is, under these terms, is it still worth going? To go under a neutral flag is a disgrace for our country, said politician Valery Gazayev. First the economic sanctions, now they do it to our sports, complained Russian Senator Igor Morozov. At the heart of Russian anger is that most here don't think their government had anything to do with Olympic cheating or believe much else about the IOC's report. Tonight, one TV show even got a world champion arm wrestler on to see if he could open the caps of infamous urine bottles that were allegedly tampered with to make clean. No luck. So, Russians will have a week to mull it over. Then a special athletes committee will decide whether they will accept the IOC's terms and send athletes to compete in South Korea. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. To get to this point took years of accusations and investigations, revelations of corruption at the highest levels of international sport, and whistleblowers were crucial. Like Olympic runner Yulia Stepanova and her husband Vitaly, who worked for Russia's anti-doping agency. We are trying to fight it for, for the right reasons. They told international authorities about Russia's methods, how widespread the cheating was. Stepanova was branded a traitor, a Judas, in the words of Vladimir Putin's spokesman. There have been threats against their lives, and they've been in hiding. But Adrian has spoken to them a number of times. Despite the risks the athletes took, because of her doping violations, Stepanova has been barred from competing. For speaking out, she and her husband have paid a heavy price. Now that Russia is facing consequences, we reached Vitaly Stepanova for his thoughts. I'm glad that the IOC heard us believed us, believed other whistleblowers, and uh, it's not a vindication, but I believe it's a good sign for anti-doping movement and for clean athletes. I guess mainly it's still a sad day that all, all, all of this was happening in, in my home country, and uh, there was absolutely no system in place to prevent that. So this is the sad part, but the good part is that the truth came out and uh, and hopefully now the system in Russia can be changed. 
It's not just the whistleblowers sharing their thoughts on all of this today. Susan Armiston spoke to some Canadian athletes who have been affected by past Russian cheating. As she tells us, while they do feel vindicated, they're not vengeful. Remember this moment at the Sochi Olympics? A top Russian Olympian hobbled by a busted ski just tries to keep going. Suddenly, the Canadian ski coach comes to his rescue with a new ski. Justin Wadsworth was that guy, a true sportsman who has waited decades for today's doping sanctions. The IOC has just been dropping the ball, in my opinion, and, and same with the IFs, uh, the, the, for example, the FIS in skiing. So I really feel like everyone needs to come clean, and, and this is a good opportunity for everyone just to admit their wrongs and admit they haven't done enough in the past. Wadsworth was himself an Olympic skier, and here comes Becky Scott. he's married to Becky Scott, who competed against Russians 15 years ago at the Salt Lake City Olympics. Scott took bronze behind Russia's gold and silver. This is one for the clean athletes. But both Russian skiers were ultimately stripped of their medals because of doping, and Scott was finally awarded the gold. For both of them, allowing clean Russian athletes to go to Pyeongchang under a neutral banner is fair. This should be a message to the Russian athletes to fight back and, and make their, their system uh, answer to them about why they've had systematic doping in the past. Are you puffing the biceps now? Sam Edney and Canada's Luge relay team took fourth in Sochi. If the Russian relay team who won silver doesn't qualify for these games, Canada could benefit. It's restored faith in myself uh, with, the, with the system, um, and I think it will restore the faith in a lot of athletes, and as, as well as the competitors, the people that love watching the Olympics. Athletes and coaches have been waiting for years for the IOC to own up to the scope of cheating, now it has to make good on screening Russian athletes for Pyeongchang. It was very frustrating and I think disappointing for a lot of us as athletes to have to, to know that going to the starting line that the, the, the competition, the level, the playing field just wasn't level. Coming down the hill we see Becky in third place, it's Chepilova in the lead, followed by... Susan Ormiston, CBC Becky News. For those athletes who didn't get a medal ceremony at Sochi, the IOC has a plan. Uh, we will uh, do our best to organize uh, ceremonies uh, for athletes during the Olympic Winter Games Pyeongchang 2018 to, uh, try, uh, to try to make up for the moments they have missed on the finish line or on the podium. So far, Russian athletes have been stripped of 11 <coughs> medals won in Sochi. Still with the Olympics, later this hour, a feature interview with Canadian gold medal hopefuls Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer. Okay, meantime, there is another developing story we're keeping an eye on. The international status of Jerusalem. It's one of the Middle East's radioactive issues. Israelis and Palestinians both claim it as their capital. Recognize one and you undermine the other. Hence, the U.S. Embassy being in Tel Aviv. And that's something no U.S. president has sought to change until now. Donald Trump is expected to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and begin the process of moving the U.S. Embassy there. The official announcement comes tomorrow. But he started making calls today to the Palestinian leader, Mahmoud Abbas, in the West Bank, to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and to leaders in Jordan, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. Abbas, in turn, called Russia. He called France. He even called the Vatican for help. This is what emergency diplomacy looks like. Derek Stoffel picks up the story from Tel Aviv. Calls between President Trump and several leaders here in the Middle East have unleashed a wave of alarm and even anger. This is why. There are concerns that if President Trump goes ahead and recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and starts the process of moving the U.S. Embassy from here in Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, the Arab world will see the United States as choosing sides, siding with Israel in the long-running dispute between the Israelis and Palestinians. Now, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, through his spokesman tonight, says that the moves could kill the peace process. King Abdullah of Jordan said the potential U.S. action could have dangerous repercussions for security throughout the region. 
and Egypt's president, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, also weighed in, telling Trump there's no need to complicate matters here in the Middle East. Palestinian factions are now calling for three days of rage right across the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. As a result, Israeli security forces are now preparing for demonstrations that could very well turn violent. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Tel Aviv. Those reactions from leaders today underscore wider worries beyond Israel and the West Bank. Concerns that the decision might throw the region into turmoil. So the question is, what might it mean for the neighbors? I know and think this is declaration will help the, the peace process. Peace to well-known Palestinian cartoonist Mohamed Sabani takes the form of a dove, an ignored, often doomed peace with the U.S. and Donald Trump as the villain. And he sees this latest move as another blow to peace. This is another back step uh, toward the, the peace process. All the Palestinian and Arab world consider uh, Jerusalem as a holy land for all the religions, not just for Jewish. Indeed, Jerusalem's old city is an example of that coexistence, a place of pilgrimage for Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike. Neighboring Jordan has helped maintain and protect these holy sites. By recognizing uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, this, of course, uh, threatens that special custodianship role. Experts say the working relationship between Jordan and Israel is at risk. Jordan has a lot of Palestinians who are uh, connected to, to, to Palestine in, in many ways, emotionally, culturally, and it would be uh, a difficult thing to accept uh, to, to continue to have a normal relation or a semi-normal relation with Israel. Sayın Trump, Müslümanların kırmızı çizgisidir. Then there's Turkey. Today, President Tayyip Erdogan threatened to cut off all diplomatic ties to Israel, which had resumed just last year, bringing Turkish aid into Gaza and billions in trade between the two countries. So this declaration could destabilize long-standing diplomatic and security relationships. Now, as Derek said earlier, three days of rage are set to begin tomorrow, and that's prompted new travel advisories tonight. The Canadian government is asking all travelers to Israel to exercise a high degree of caution for the next three days. And the U.S. Consulate General in Jerusalem announced today that U.S. government employees are not permitted to travel to Jerusalem and the West Bank until further notice. This includes family of U.S. government employees as well. Well, ahead on the national controversial Alabama Senate candidate, Roy Moore is chest deep in sexual misconduct allegations that will not go away, and yet he could still win it. Keith Bove looks at why. After a series of youth suicides in northern Saskatchewan, we'll tell you about a new plan to turn things around with input from young people themselves. And the Golden State in flames, raging wildfires forcing tens of thousands to flee, leaving Californians to wonder if this devastating fire season will ever end. I've been an owner for 40 years here, and it's just uh, crazy what's gone on. This was going to be my die in a house. The only thing is the house died before I did. On The National Tonight, another actor has been fired over sexual assault allegations. Danny Masterson was on that 70s show and, until now, on the Netflix series The Ranch. They let him go after multiple women accused him of sexual assault. Masterson has denied the allegations, but Los Angeles police say they are investigating. My, my legacy can't be compromised or diminished in any way uh, by what we're going through now. This too shall pass. That was Democratic Representative John Conyers on the radio this morning. He's still denying allegations he sexually harassed former employees. But today, after intense pressure to resign, the 88-year-old announced he's retiring immediately. In Alabama tonight, a candidate whose political brand is defiance of the Washington establishment, who is intensely polarizing and dogged by controversy. A candidate who electrified a crowd of supporters. And no, we're not talking about Donald Trump. 
Roy Moore is running for the U.S. Senate. The vote is next week. The biggest electoral test for the Republicans since Trump won the election last year. At times, Moore has trailed in the polls, which is saying something for a Republican in Alabama. Several women have come forward accusing him of sexual misconduct when they were teens. Moore denies it. Trump stands by him. And right here on this night, so do his supporters. Well, Keith Bogue is in Fairhope, Alabama tonight. And, and Keith, we often hear Moore described as an alleged sexual abuser, but how do his supporters down there see him? Well, they're brushing it off. I mean, clearly these were the most devoted supporters out here tonight to hear Roy Moore speak. And we spoke to a number of them who all said essentially the same thing. Uh, either they said that in the United States of America, everyone is innocent until they are proven guilty, or they said that these alleged incidents happened 40 years ago. Why are the women only coming forward at this time when there's an election underway, suggesting that there was some kind of conspiracy against Roy Moore? But we also spoke to a spokesman for the campaign who admitted this is a much tighter race than anybody thought it would be. The polls are now showing uh, that there's been a little bounce back for Roy Moore, but he's still only leading in the race by a point or two. Uh, and though the campaign says they expect that next Tuesday, when the votes are all counted, he'll have won by 10 percentage points, normally a Republican in this state, Alabama, would be winning this race by about 30 points. So it's much tighter than anybody expected. You were at the rally tonight. Steve Bannon was on the stage, a former member of the Trump administration, and now he has declared war on the Republican establishment. So what should we make of Bannon's appearance? Well, Bannon clearly was trying to reframe the whole election as a referendum on Donald Trump's agenda, and he was telling the people, you know, don't let them take your voice away. But he spent more time attacking the Republic Republican establishment than he did attacking Democrats. He named Jeff Flake, he named Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan, he even named Mitt Romney as enemies of the base, the Trump-supporting base of the party. And he repeated again and again, you cannot let these people take the voice of the deplorables away from them. You have to get out. You have to vote for Roy Moore. Keith Bogue in Alabama tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Well, still to come this hour on the national Southern California burning. Tens of thousands flee as one of the worst wildfire seasons in the state's history flares up again. And the U.S. Supreme Court debates a potentially landmark case that pits gay rights against freedom of speech, all over a wedding cake. I respectfully decline to create a custom cake that would celebrate a view of marriage in direct conflict with my faith's core teachings. And we felt like second-class citizens in our society. Be ready to go. We say ready, set, go. Right now, make sure that you have those critical documents, the critical stuff that you need. Have it ready, put it in your car, and when you hear go, go. That's the kind of warning thousands of Californians were woken up to as a pair of fast-moving wildfires closed in on them. Tens of thousands of people have already been forced from their homes, and here's why. The first fire began yesterday evening north of Santa Paula, California, and it grew fast and furious. By midday today, it had spread over 200 square kilometers in Ventura County, including the city of Ventura itself. About 100,000 people lived there. At least 150 structures, including homes, were burned to the ground, and California declared a state of emergency. But then things got worse. A second fire broke out at around 3.30 a.m. local time. It burned into Los Angeles County, including the northern neighborhoods of L.A., forcing the evacuation of 2,500 homes. Those are two out of several fires burning in the region right now. And CBC's Kim Brunhuber saw the extent of it all firsthand. He spent the day near the flames in Ventura County. They may call it the Thomas Fire, but you get the sense as you walk in the smoky, blackened landscape that there isn't just one fire, but hundreds, thousands. Here, moments ago, a tree burst into flame. Here is a field on fire. Here, firefighters have been on their feet for more than 12 hours, hopping from one set of flames to the next. At one end of the city of Santa Paula, the fire has come and gone. 200 meters away, this family waits, anxious for news. They evacuated their home yesterday in the dead of night. It was behind us and it was in front of us. 
So we were trapped in, and so we had to get out. Yeah. You were basically surrounded. On, surrounded. On that side and this side. Right. They came back this morning to see if their house was still standing. I came from that direction, so they asked me. A small little house, yeah, and then a, a bigger house next to it. Yeah. So both of those have burned. Yeah, I'm sorry to, to say that was that yeah. was yours. Yeah. Oh man. Thank you. Sorry about that. There's just one of more than a thousand homes lost in this parched land. Too much wind and not enough water. These topography wind-driven fires are just impossible to to get ahead of. There's not enough resources, and um, you know. It's, yeah, it, takes, it takes the entire mutual aid system to even put a dent in it. If he sounds hopeless, maybe it's because he too lost most of his home last night. There's one right there. Trying to boost morale are Marlene Dionisio and her friends with their homemade signs. <laughs> to be honest, I was really scared of what was going on, and then I saw all these firemen coming from different cities and stuff, and I really want to show them that we really appreciate what they're doing for us. Here in the middle of the hot zone, you come across ghosts in the smoke volunteers fighting the flames as best they can. With this smoky eclipse, it's hard to see, hard to breathe. It's raining ash. There's fire all around. Even if you can't see it, you know it's there. I leave the part of town where the fire is, head towards where it's going. At the other end of Santa Paula, a frantic rush to evacuate to get residents on the road before the fire beats them to it. You're not scared, man? No, español. Tienen uh, miedo? Are you scared, I ask her? Yes, she says, not for me, but for the children. She's right to be scared. See these hills there? The flames have grown visibly in just the time I've been watching them fanned by these monster winds. On the roofs, residents like Joe Pacheco are trying to protect their homes. No, I've never seen anything like this since I've been here. Been born and raised here and never have. So Pacheco keeps watering, hoping for an early Christmas miracle with fire on both sides and closing in. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Santa Paula, California. All of that devastation comes near the end of the worst wildfire season in California history. In October alone, at least 43 people were killed and more than 10,000 buildings were lost as aggressive wildfires swept through wine country. And the big worry tonight is we may not have seen the worst of it. Now, meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff has been tracking this for us. And Joe, can you start by explaining why this year has been as bad as it has been? Well, Andrew, a couple of unique weather conditions have come together to sort of create the perfect storm for explosive fires. First of all, the Santa Ana winds have been in full force, drawing up hot, dry desert air and moving it towards the coast where it races through the valleys and inlets heating up and speeding up to create those explosive fire conditions. We've also had a lot of vegetation growth after a record wet winter followed by a very hot summer for California and that dried out all the brush, basically creating fuels for these uh, fires to burn through, Andrew. And so Joe, look into the, the future for me if you could. I mean, how, how much worse are we expecting things to get from here? Well, unfortunately, these Santa Ana winds are going to be in place for days. We could be talking hurricane force gusts over the next few nights. Unusual to see this in place for so long. On top of that, a huge high pressure system is in place from British Columbia through to California. No rain in the forecast for almost two weeks. Again, a very unusual setup. All of these factors will likely be amplified uh, by climate change, unfortunately, as we move uh, forward in time, Andrew. All righty. Thanks, Joe. And Ian, the uh, ever-increasing threat of wildfires, something we're sadly accustomed to here in British Columbia as well. And Andrew, let's uh, move to Saskatchewan now, where people know there is a problem when it comes to suicide and young Indigenous people. And the province's advocate for young people says it is time to tackle this head-on. One of the fears was if you talk to children and youth about suicide, they're going to do it. Well, the fact is they're already doing it. They're not talking to the people uh, the adults in their community, their parents and their families, and those are the people that really need to hear this. For too many teens, the odds are inescapable. Someone they know is going to kill themselves. It's only a matter of time. Suicide rates in Saskatchewan are 26 times higher for Indigenous girls than their non-Indigenous peers, six times higher for Indigenous boys. The issue came to shocking light in October of last year when six girls in northern Saskatchewan 
all between the ages of 10 and 14, kill themselves. The province's advocate for children and youth investigated and says that he discovered young people know what the problem is and they know what needs to be done. Corio Soup's report focused on what he heard directly from the Indigenous youth he spoke to. They had several calls to action. Stop bullying in their communities. Increase emotional support for families. Address drug and alcohol use. And provide more diverse activities for youth. Osoup says it's also critical that the federal and provincial governments end inequity in health care funding for Indigenous children and back suicide prevention strategies. Our Olivia Stefanovic spoke to some of those teens and heard a better strategy is a matter of life and death. Well, uh, it was quite of a, um, a bit of a hard downfall for like about two years. 15-year-old uh, Daniel uh, Bird nervously the recalls the moment that yeah, changed yeah. everything for him. Here and there. The night before my, my mother passed, um, all I could really remember is that I was yelling at her and all that kind of stuff. And, in the morning, I woke up and, you know, I came to check on her and, well, I was just trying to, I was just trying to make sure she was okay and... Daniel yeah, says he pushed his ear against his mom to see if she was breathing. She wasn't. It's like, it felt like walls were enclosing around me and I felt like they, they weren't there, like, weren't real at all, but yet I could just feel it starting to gently squeeze up against me. It was a feeling of loss, desperation that so many teens in this part of Saskatchewan know. I'm kind of don't have a great connection with all the people here anymore. Joel Cross is the same age as Daniel. He wants to get out of LaRange. And a lot of people don't feel comfortable here, don't feel safe. You only hear about the things that happen bad in this town. Daniel only opened up about his experience when the province's child and youth advocate visited kind of his community this past like year. Like he says he's found strength since and has this message for others. You are perfect and you are born and you were and you were born perfect. It's just that your situations always weren't perfect. A sentiment that he hopes other young people think about before they consider taking their own lives. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News. LaRange, Saskatchewan. Ahead on the National, Susan Ormiston speaks with two of Canada's brightest hopes for Olympic gold in South Korea. Ice dancers Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer open up about their long partnership and the challenges of launching a comeback. What's been the hardest part? Getting used to the pressure again. I think I underestimated just how nervous we would get. And this is all leading into the PyeongChang Olympics and we have to be perfect. If we're able to take the ice in Pyeongchang and feel like we did everything we possibly could to set ourselves up for that moment, that has, that has to be enough. After returning to active competition a year ago, Canada's premier ice dance duo is ready to take on the world in South Korea. But the path to the podium is difficult and the challenges aren't just on the ice. Still, Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer are absolutely focused on winning gold in Pyeongchang, just as they did in Vancouver, and as many believe they were robbed of doing in Sochi. Susan Ormiston sat down with the skating stars ahead of a competition in Japan later this week and talked about refinding their edge. Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer have been paired up longer than any other skating duo in Canada. Blazing down the highway as we left the city of Versailles. Their intimate professional relationship has weathered 20 years of success and less ever since coaches put the two promising juniors together back in 1997. That's a lot of growing up side by side. Tessa, you're so poised and so professional and you meet these big performance challenges on a regular basis. What rattles you? Mostly I get rattled by feeling like we're not measuring up or feeling like, you know, we're 
failing um, one another in, in some way, but I'm so grateful that we have such a solid partnership and after 20 years that we can speak about that openly and honestly and, and come together and, and find solutions and, and feel that support and comfort. You know what's funny is I, I always hoped that you know, they would ask different questions, like you, the hard questions to me, and but that is not one I would want to answer. I, I don't think I have an answer for what rattles you. You're pretty. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> what rattles you then? I don't know. You invited Letting it. down tea, I think, would be the biggest thing. That's something I couldn't live with. And that's when I looked at the beginning of this year, what can't I live with? And letting down Tessa was number one, I think. You know, we've done all this together. I want to end this on a good note. And I don't see that happening to you. Never, no, you couldn't. So I have to ask you this. So 20 years, it's like a marriage, right? <laughs> so after 20 years, what bugs you about your partner? You know, it's this, It's a sick answer. I think people are going to be really <laughs> it's upset. It's going to be sappy, it. isn't it? Oh, <laughs> my God. But you know, it's crazy. And this, like, some days, like, I look at Tessa, I just think, like, this is such a funny little relationship that we have. Because it's better than it was um, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, five years ago, winning the Olympics, in our biggest fights. like. In our highest moments, I think now it's better than it's ever been. And, and that's a friendship. Okay, Tessa, your turn. What bugs me? Well, you're punctual now. That used to be a thing that, <laughs> that he's on time all the time. Uh -oh. Canada, representing Canada, Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer. Virtue and Moyer soared into Canadians' hearts at the Vancouver Olympics. Gold medalist and Olympic champions representing Canada Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer. Four years later in Sochi, our golden duo in ice dance went for a second gold. That was a study in subtle perfection. But after a nasty judging controversy, alleging the result was predetermined, they got silver. Gold medalist representing United States of America. And after Sochi, retired from competition. Don't nobody kiss it like you. Don't nobody kiss it like you. Bang, bang, bang. Hey, hey, hey. Then they joined the pro circuit on shows like Stars on Ice. But it turns out, not for long. You have an announcement to make. What is it, Tess? I'll give you the honor. Oh, well, thank you. We've decided to return to competition, and we are so excited. The skating couple came roaring back. Oh, my goodness. This is Olympic gold medal worthy, should they do it that way. This year, reclaiming top marks in ice dance, going into the Grand Prix final this week, number two behind the French, and razor focused on the Pyeongchang Olympics. So it is a risk, retiring and then coming back. What's been the hardest part? Getting used to the pressure again. I think I underestimated just how nervous we would get and everyone always thinks that because we've performed so many times that it's easy. But when we take the ice now, I think I'm more nervous than I've ever been. The, the difference is I can control it a little bit better, but that pure excitement uh, can sometimes be a little bit overwhelming. I mean, this is all leading into the Pyeongchang Olympics and we have to be perfect in those mere minutes, you know, on the world stage. But perfection doesn't exist. So we've had to adjust that mindset and, and try to chase excellence instead. It's unlikely, given the stellar year you've had, that you won't medal in these Olympics, but it could happen. How have you psychologically prepared for that? It's hard to imagine failure at this point, because if, if we're able to take the ice in Pyeongchang and feel like we did everything we possibly could to set ourselves up for that moment, that has, that has to be enough. Can I ask you about 2014? Uh, many people think that there was uh, controversy around that mm -hmm. gold-silver alignment. You came home with the silver, the Americans took the gold. Yeah. People suggest that there was rigging in the judging. Has judging changed? What was most disheartening about that was we love skating and we want other people to feel the same way. Mm -hmm. and when any kind of controversy comes into it, which is natural in a subjective sport, um, you know, it, it does sort of tarnish it. Are you confident, though, that it has changed enough that supporters and fans and skaters can have full confidence in the judging? Other people say to me, not. 
we do feel like there has been a change and we do feel like the judging um, of figure skating is improving. The Olympics are now scarcely eight weeks away and Pyeongchang finds itself in the middle of geopolitical tensions. While there is often an unofficial truce around the games, the lead up has been fraught with unsettling signals. Do you have concerns about what could happen at Pyeongchang? Of course. I know I think we'd be lying if we said there weren't concerns. Um, yeah. And it sounds so selfish when we just say, oh, but our job is to focus on athletics because there's so much more mm -hmm. happening in the world. And it's, it's so much greater than that. But you hope that st staying true to the Olympic spirit, we can be free of that for one month. <laughs> Do you have any fear about it? I have fear, of, obviously, whenever we have family members there, that for their safety and for... Um, you know, innocent people's safety, that's, that's a fear of ours, but you know, there are things that you have to kind of understand about the politics of sport that are a little bit out of our control and um, hoping that the spirit of the Olympic Games can, the positives can outweigh the negatives. I think that's a perfect place to end. Thank you so much. You. We'll see you in Pyeongchang. I'll be there. Yeah, I hope so. All of Canada be rooting for you and um, best of luck. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. We'll be right back. But first, a reminder, you can go deeper on the stories of the day earlier in the day. Subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash the national. Stay on top of your game with CBC Sports. Stream live events online. Get the latest news on the CBC Sports app and stay connected on social media. I got the game on lock for sure. On the National Tonight, authorities in Germany are trying to figure out what went wrong after a passenger train collided with a freight train. It happened at around 7.30 p.m. local time near the city of Dusseldorf. Officials say several people were hurt, three of them quite badly. Well, there might be hope yet for a Canadian trade deal with China. It's all come right down to the wire. In a last-minute decision, the Canadian trade minister decided to stay in Beijing to keep talking with his Chinese counterparts. Katie Simpson is covering the Prime Minister's trip and has more from China on how it all unfolded today. The late-night drama started here. The Prime Minister and his inner circle sitting down to talk trade over dinner with China's most powerful leader. I know that as we uh, look to building uh, a better future for the entire world, the friendship between Canada and China uh, will play an important role uh, in um, setting uh, the tone and the approach uh, that uh, the, will characterize the 21st century. By evening's end, government officials say there was enough willingness to push forward and have Canada's trade minister cancel his plans and go back to the table. The decision was so unexpected, the minister's staff had to get off the prime minister's plane, which was about to depart for the next leg of Justin Trudeau's China tour. When you negotiate in China, you have to be patient if you want the outcome to be beneficial and profitable for you. And I think that's what Mr. Trudeau is doing, is taking his time. Canadian business leaders who met with Trudeau earlier in the day say they were reassured by the government it is pushing behind the scenes to get these talks formally launched. I think they're still working. As you know, the, I think the term is, is the cake is not baked yet, but they're very active. It is welcome news for them since they fear diminished access to the American market if Donald Trump pulls out of NAFTA. For us to manage that risk is we want to be able to do agreements with, uh, with all the other countries. Even though the trade minister did not travel here to Guangzhou with the prime minister, it doesn't necessarily mean a deal is guaranteed. But if Canada wants this to happen before Trudeau returns home, time is running out as Justin Trudeau flies back to Ottawa in less than two days. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Guangzhou, China. So what's the reporting been like on this story within China? Well, it turns out a lot of the focus is on the importance of relationship building and the long view. Take this op-ed, for example, in the Global Times. The headline, China-Canada trade agreement need not rush for success. The author says the bond between the two countries is basic but not yet mature and points to a famous Chinese proverb. 
the melon will fall off the stem when it is ripe, suggesting there may be hope for fruitful negotiations given time. Okay, let's take you back to North America. A potentially landmark case is before the U.S. Supreme Court right now, pitting gay rights against freedom of speech. And at the center of the controversy, a Christian cake maker. I'm here at the Supreme Court today because I respectfully declined to create a custom cake that would celebrate a view of marriage in direct conflict with my faith's core teachings on marriage. So here he is, Jack Phillips. In 2012, he refused to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. They called it discrimination. And now, more than five and a half years later, that dispute has made its way all the way to the Supreme Court. This has never been about a cake. And this isn't about weddings. This is about freedom. By all accounts, it will be a close decision with this man, Justice Anthony Kennedy, likely to cast the deciding vote. He is a staunch defender of freedom of speech, but has also written all of the Supreme Court's decisions favoring gay rights. So the difficult question he and the others will need to answer, would baking a wedding cake for a same-sex couple have forced Phillips to go against his religious beliefs? It's not a small question by any measure, and of course, Ian, the consequences of this decision could be quite far-reaching. And it's interesting how it's being framed. It's being framed as a freedom of speech argument, and so what freedom of speech do you have in making a cake? And as the justices asked today, would that then go to the freedom of speech of a dressmaker? It's, it's all very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. We'll end it there. That's The National for December 5th. Have a great night. Good night.